Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, joined, as always, for our weekly Penn State sports show by Seth Engel of the Daily Collegian and the Post-Gazette. Seth, how are you? Are you ready for Penn State Michigan week? Yeah, it's yeah, fun. It feels like less pressure than the Ohio State week for some reason. Like, it's just – I mean, it feels like a big game, but it's like – I don't know. It's more relaxing. You don't have to travel – um, but it's still the same implications. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, on, on uh, Saturday. Yeah, I think there's a, I probably think there's probably less pressure on Penn State in this game too, because I think this is the game people always pointed to and thought it would be tougher. And that doesn't mean that they're not going to get crap if they if they don't win. It's just that I think expectations for this game have always been a little bit lower than they were for Ohio State, and that's why Ohio State was was such a gut punch for a lot of people because. I think there was belief that this was this was finally the year Penn State was going to beat that team, um, and, and it wasn't. So um, we're going to dig into all of that, the Michigan game coming up. Uh, we're going to dig into some of James Franklin's comments about after the win against Maryland this week, and we're going to talk a little hoops. Penn State basketball kicked off on Monday night, beat Delaware State pretty bad, badly, a nice night for Kanye Clary and the uh, basketball line. So we're going to get into all of that. Before we do, just want to thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast, uh, Voodoo Brewery in State College. Just in time for the change in weather, the crew at Voodoo Brewing in State College, located right off College Avenue at 201 Elmwood Street, has launched their new seasonally inspired line of cocktails, including the crowd favorite hot spiked apple cider. And that's not all. Beginning uh, in October, they opened their State College pub uh, kitchen. The kitchen is owned and operated by Voodoo Brewing and will op- uh, feature elevated pub fare made famous by their other Voodoo locations. They will also continue to offer items like the lobster roll and crab cake sandwich that have become synonymous with the State College Pub. So make sure you get out to Voodoo Brewing. Um, Seth, James Franklin was asked, you know, kind of about the Indiana game still this past week after beating Maryland pretty badly. Um, And and his reaction was a a level of of annoyance that um, he feels like he doesn't get to celebrate the wins that the Penn State racks up. They, They do, you know, they've won 10 games a year pretty frequently. But it seemed like people were still fixated on the fact that they only won by nine against against Indiana, didn't cover, even though they've covered for, for weeks and weeks. So not only were they winning games, but they were beating expectations almost every week for an entire year. And then, you know, you lose to Ohio State and then you have a little bit of a hangover against Indiana. And and despite beating Maryland by you know scoring 51 points and beating them really badly, um, you're still kind of talking about the Indiana game. Um, you were in the room for that. Did you feel like he was – do you think there's any validity to the gripes that, that he was kind of expressing? Because some people thought he um, – they kind of took it as whining on social media. I'll give you my thoughts in a second, but you were there, so I wanted to hear what you thought. Yeah, I mean, the reality was he wasn't – he wasn't really asked about the Indiana game. That's not what it was. It was more so a follow-up answer on this tangent he's really been on since after the Ohio State game, um, which saw, you know, the first – kind of struggles of, of this year's team um, and that he, he doesn't feel like Penn State's getting the respect that maybe it, de- it deserves. And I think a close win over a, you know, a pretty bad Indiana team um, kind of pushed that narrative even more. Um, so it was discussed, you know, last week on Wednesday after practice um, where he went on this whole tangent about, um, you know, people being critical of Penn State and that, you know, it's hard to win games. And I mean, that was basically the bottom line is that it's hard to win. It's hard to win games and it's even harder to win games in the Big Ten. Um, and you have to celebrate those as close as they are. Um, but I, I mean, I do I, I wouldn't say it's whining, um, but I will say that, you know, James, you know, he has gone on this tangent for a, about a few weeks now um, where he, he seems like he's lacking focus on. He says that he wants to just focus on his team, but at the same time, he's saying stuff like this, which is um, creating this outside noise um, that really isn't accomplishing much at all. Um, I do think that wins do count. Um, And James said on Wednesday, you know, he doesn't want to apologize for winning and he shouldn't. Um, But when you narrowly beat Indiana and, you know, almost lose in the final minutes, you know, that's, you're not going to enter that press conference, especially when it was just a few minutes before, that you were tied up with the Hoosiers and feel like you came out with a strong victory. That's just not the reality. Um, and I think James, you know, he, he might need to accept that in, in tough victories that, 
you know, there are going to be difficult questions because there were difficult things that happened in the game despite coming out with the win. Um, so that's my take. But Yeah, I want to talk about the focus of the program going into this big game in a second. But I, I will say that, and I tweeted about this to, to some extent, it, it, it's not James Franklin's fault that every team that he plays on, these, on this Big Ten schedule right now stinks on some level. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily always easy to win. But, but these teams have, have lined up and been beaten badly by him for a period of a year. And, you know, as soon as, as soon as he starts running up the score, everyone, all those teams that, like, you know, make fun of him for losing to Ohio State and Michigan are the, also the first people in line to be like, oh, he's running up the score through another touchdown in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, so, like, like there's just so many of these teams are losers to me, Seth. And, and, and that's not James Franklin's fault. It's not, it's not James Franklin's fault that Maryland came out and played that game, despite having what I thought was a pretty decent team going in. You and I talked about it on the, on this podcast. I didn't think they'd, they'd win that badly. I thought they might win comfortably, but that was a blowout. They blew out. They destroyed Ohio or Iowa in, um in the whiteout game. They d- pretty well handled West Virginia these teams just are not very good, and I don't know where people want James Franklin to go to to get these big wins if it's not going to be Ohio State and Michigan. If you if it, it, I understand his frustration that the whole season kind of boils down to two games for a lot of people, but that it's not his fault. It's the fault of all of these teams, and it's not just the Big Ten teams that they're playing. You know, people complain about the non-conference schedule. Go out and play someone, and I had a guy in my Twitter mentions listing off Alabama, LSU. Guess what? Those teams played other teams in the South this year. Um, Notre Dame played Ohio State. The idea that these teams are just available to be scheduled every year all the time is is wrong, number one. And number two, you know, you usually schedule teams in your region, you know, in, in the out-of-conference. And that's what Penn State's done. They're going to Syracuse, uh, West Virginia. Pitt was on the schedule for four years. It's not James Franklin's fault that those teams stink, too, this year. Like if you look at a 13 state northeast region, the only team that matters is Penn State. And that's not James Franklin's fault either. And I'm not making excuses for losing to Ohio State and Michigan, but I think people got to keep in perspective that it's it's not the SEC and there's not a big game every week. You're not you're not going to play a team that's ranked in the the te- you know, the mid teens right now. And and if you can't do that, then of course your record against ranked teams is going to be bad when the ranked teams are ranked in the top 5 and they're Ohio State and Michigan. Um, so that's that's just my little little rant. Like, I get his his level of frustration. A that he's not winning these games to kind of put this narrative to the curb, and that's on him. But what's not on him is is that football in the North is in a bad place right now. Other than these three programs that we talk about all the time, um, and it it'd be you know it's time someone called out these teams for not being very good, and that's their fault. Um, I, there there's the end of my rant. There I want to get into James Franklin's mindset though, in that you mentioned this in in your answer to my first question, which was um, why is he focusing on this? And do you worry that the, the, the creeping, you know, pressure on him is going to lead to some questionable decisions because we've seen that against Michigan in the past. I think there was that fourth down against Michigan two years ago at Beaver stadium. Um, There was the fourth down he was questioned for against Ohio state. And this, this aggressiveness that he sometimes seems to show as if, He's trying to show the world, oh, I, you know, I, I'm not too afraid to beat these teams. Do you worry going into a game like this that the pressure is getting to him and that that's going to affect decisions in the heat of the moment? What I will say is that, you know, for all the drama and kind of outside noise um, that comes with the Penn State football program, um, whether that's from Franklin personally or not, um, Penn State is one of the most simple teams in the country, and that is because it has – Two jobs the whole season is just to beat Ohio State and Michigan. Um, like you said, their their schedule outside of, you know, those two games are very easy. You know, all the teams, they, they all suck. You know, Maryland was seen as a trap game, um, and they came in there and dropped 51 points. Illinois was seen as a trap game, and they covered the spread. Like, it's – it's the, 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 the best teams next to Ohio State and Michigan are terrible. You know, they're bad. Um, But when it comes down to it, like none of this will matter if he's able to beat Michigan on Saturday. We won't be having these conversations anymore. No one's going to be raising an eye. They're going to say, oh, Penn State's all of a sudden a contender. You know, they could they could make the playoff this year. Um, They could potentially compete for a national title um, if they beat Michigan. 
So it, it's, it's, it all comes down to that. And it's like, it's kind of interesting to me when I, when I see him go on these, on these tangents, um, because none of it matters. Like it doesn't, all that matters is if you win the two games that you're, that you have to, that's all that matters. Or win um, one of them. I mean, you don't have to like yeah, one you know, or the other, though, they probably yeah. asking a lot, but you got to win yeah. one. But after, after losing the one that many people thought you were going to win, like, of course, there are going to be tough questions. And, and the season appears different. And there are going to be difficult questions that are asked in the press conferences. And in a close game at Indiana, I'll say it again, that wasn't a good – like, it wasn't a good showing at all. There were there were struggles on both sides of the ball. And there are going to be questions that are posed as if the team didn't just win because it, it didn't seem like they were a winning team for most of that game. That's, that's – yeah. 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 And I just, you know, I just wonder, you know, is 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 a game like this going to hinge on him kind of having that in the back of his mind that, you know, we, we got to have some some style in doing this and, and get some people's attention. And, and really all that matters to your point, Seth, is you just got to beat Michigan. Um, although I will say this before we get into talking about this game in earnest, um, does it concern you at all from a, from a playoff? Let, let's just assume that they win this game, which is a big if, but let's just take ourselves to that place. Do you look at the schedule and say, geez, this could be a real liability if you look at the fact that Penn State's toward the back of the line of one loss teams? You have a lot of teams that still don't have a loss yet. Um, you know, I think I've assumed for a lot of the season, if you win one of these games, you're going to be in the playoff. I'm starting to to lose that faith. And I I do think that's probably part of why he's talking about these wins as w- this way as well, because let's say they do beat Michigan. You don't want to leave the the perception out there that you beat a, a terrible schedule if you're going to have to be compared against all these other teams. And, you know, I think this is the big concern. If Ohio State wins and beats Michigan um, and, and Penn State beats Michigan, Michigan's out of the conversation, um, but Ohio State's still probably going to go because they beat P- Penn State and they'll be going to the, the conference title game. And you're talking about Penn State being the possible number two option. Um, that's That's got to be scary for, for James Franklin, right? I mean, th- th- aren't you starting to worry about this resume a little bit? I, yeah, I, I would worry in the fact that Ohio State also beat Notre Dame. So, like, they have that. That's the edge. So, so if if Ohio State does, in fact, lose to Michigan, and then it's that, that three-way tie with the one loss, that is if Penn State does beat Michigan this weekend, um, Ohio State's going to have the edge in the college football playoff discussion because they have that Notre Dame win. Um, the resumes – the Ohio State's resume is far and away better than – the Michigan and Penn State's Um, because you look at all the bad teams that Penn State's played outside of Ohio State, Michigan is no one, Um, which is actually an advantage that I think Penn State has going into this game is that this team has already played a tough opponent this year. They've seen one of the nation's best defenses. It was only a couple weeks ago. They're prepared for it. They've been waiting for another shot at at another, you know, premier defense. Um, Michigan, while they do have, you know, a more experienced offense that has faced tough defenses before, hasn't had that in over a year. Um, so it, that'll that'll be interesting to kind of look at. You know, with that being said, I think Michigan still has the advantage. I think they're the better team, and they're one of the most complete teams, if not the most complete team in the entire country. Um, but but that's just something to look at, especially when you look at um, how these schedules are are laid out and. And, um, you know, whether whether you are advantaged by having an easy schedule, um, except for those two games, you know, obviously none of this is going to matter in a year when everyone's going to have a difficult schedule. Um, but for right now, you know, it, it, it could come down to, you know, that final week, maybe even the Big Ten championship for to determine which which Big Ten team, um, if not two, actually end up going to the playoff. Yeah, it's just it's just kind of unbelievably bleak for me in the Big Ten right now. If there was not expansion coming and you weren't ex- adding four teams that are ranked right now, what would the Big Ten like? What where would the Big Ten be if not for expansion right now? I think it'd be in a pretty bad place if you're comparing it to the SEC yeah. um, and and the outlook here. I, I think expansion almost feels necessary in that context. Um, but that's a topic for another day. Seth, let's dig into this game specifically. Um, first, get the sign stealing stuff out of the. Uh, out of the picture. Do you think that matters at all at this point? Um, you know, given that it's out and out in the open, Penn state's had a chance to prepare for it, or is it just really outside noise before a game of this magnitude at this point? 
Well, it has to matter. I mean, this is the week that we've already heard uh, the Big Ten has, has notified um, Michigan of, um, you know, potential punishments in the near future. We're not sure exactly when that'll be. Clock's kind of ticking. It's Tuesday now. Um, you know, we've heard that Jim Harbaugh, you know, probably isn't going to be, you know, one of the guys uh, punished, you know, if they are to lay out punishments. Um but I think there are a number of, you know, potential impacts. This is an investigation um, that's, you know, it's covering a lot of things. You know, it's stretching to central Michigan. Um, this could be something that's huge and potentially um, says something about the Michigan Athletic Department. We don't know. Um, but I think it has to matter. You know, I, I think Michigan, you know, when it all comes down to it, is an extremely dominant team. And despite the drama they've had over the past couple of weeks, um, you know, over the scandal, they, it, it hasn't really made an impact at all. Um, but you know, it's kind of wait and see right now, you know, Franklin was asked about it and asked about Harbaugh on Monday and obviously, you know, didn't get into any specifics, but, you know, he said before Penn state's adjusted some things and how they, how they signal their, their plays. I know Drew Allers also a couple weeks ago started wearing a play sheet on his arm, um, that was something he discussed today to, you know, maybe catch the defense more off guard. And these are all precautions that they had to take because of the scandal. So, you know, it's it's impacted Penn State and it's impacted every team on Michigan's schedule, um, you know, after the scandal broke. So, you know, I, I don't I, we'll see uh, in terms of punishments, whether they do come out this week. But, you know, it's all very wait and see right now. And, you know, maybe something will happen before this episode's even posted. Yeah, we're recording this on Tuesday. So if something happens at some point on Wednesday or, or even Tuesday evening, um, you'll know about it or at least check it out. But but I somehow doubt that this is going to have any teeth, Seth, honestly. I mean, you look at all of, all of the things that have happened in college sports since Penn State was the last team that was really meaningfully sanctioned, um, you know, in, in, in a major I – just, I just have a hard time thinking they're going to say, yeah, we're banning you from the postseason for this. Yeah, we're going to suspend – uh, Jim Harbaugh, and, and we're going to put, you know, one of the, like, it, just going back to that that conversation we were having before about how bad the Big Ten is. Can you really afford to torpedo one of your flagship programs um, over over this? I I have my doubts, and and that doesn't mean that it's right, but um, that's just not how college sports works. I mean, it's not always fair, and and you know, sometimes you you got to take that for what it is in this in this sport. So I I have my doubts that it's going to be meaningful have teeth deter anything in any meaningful way um you know it, it might hurt michigan at the margins but but that seems to be the only punishment anyone in college athletics is willing to level at this point um let's let's get into the physical physicality of the game james franklin said physical a lot during his news conference on monday um we know michigan is physical we know that they um you know manhandled penn state in a lot of ways last year in ann arbor um can Penn State win a physical game? Have you seen enough from this team over the past year to believe that that they can grind one out against a, a team? And do you look at that Iowa game maybe as – we've talked about it as a template before. Is that is that maybe the sign that the Penn State can win a game of, of, you know, attrition like that? Yeah, I mean, the Iowa game has to be the template for this one because that was another dominant defense um, that Penn State played very well against, um, especially on the offensive end. Um you know, it's when you look back at Michigan last year, um, the clear problem was was run defense. Um, <laughs> Michigan, you know, tallied over 400 rushing yards. Um, it was just a completely dominant performance, and Penn State did not, you know, stand the test at all. Franklin, um, you know, told the media post game that is that he's not big enough in the trenches. He called out the defensive line, um, and since then, the defensive line has put on weight and really targeted run defense. Um, and they are now one of the best run defenses in the entire country. Last week against Maryland, they held the Terrapins to negative 49 rushing yards. So with that being said, you know, they are in a good position now. Like I can't, I, Michigan's a great, a great uh, rushing offense, but, you know, Penn State has showed that they can stop the run. Um, you know, it'll just be interesting to see whether they can do it against Corum and, and Donovan Edwards, two of the most established backs in the nation. Um but I, I do think that they are in a position to be more physical. You know, but my, my you know, worry would be with the offensive line. 
um, and whether that's able to stand the test against, you know, another great Michigan D. Um, and, and that Michigan secondary is another thing. So is Drew Aller going to have time, you know, not just because of his line, but is he also is he going to have the time to find open receivers who are potentially going to be locked up by, you know, some really dynamic um, defensive backs? Yeah, I, I think I'll be interested to see that matchup play out. But, you know, if you roll, if you look down the stats set, there's no like Aiden Hutchinson on this that, that, that like, you know, is just a total monster or David Ojaba. Like the, those guys a couple of years ago that came into Happy Valley and just wrecked that game. Um, I'm not saying that Michigan doesn't have a good front, but, you know, I think the absence of those like guys that, that are just popping off the, the screen at you is, is definitely conspicuous. And I think that, yeah, you're bringing up a lot of little things that like if Penn State, it just improves against the run. Doesn't get shredded, um, and that doesn't mean that Michigan's not going to get their yards. That doesn't mean Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards aren't going to have have their moments. But if you if you avoid getting absolutely backbroken, um, is, do you see that as the goal for this Penn State defense? Is just keep Michigan in front of you to the extent you can. Don't get backbroken, and you're going to be in this game at the end. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably the goal in any game um, is just to not really break things open. But I think we're forgetting the fact that J.J. McCarthy, I know we talked about at the beginning of the year, but he really has – he's developed into a, a, a pretty good quarterback. Um, they can throw the ball. You know, Roman Wilson's had a great year. Um, you know, their tight end, I'm forgetting his name. You know, he's been great as well. Like, they have weapons and and they can throw the ball if need be. Um so, I mean, it, it, it is a really good offense. You know, it's a complete offense, and it's an experienced offense um, with J.J. back for another year and, and the running backs back for another year. Um, you know, and they've, they're leading the Big Ten in scoring. You know, I know you can look at kind of Penn State and how Penn State's averaging over 40 points a game and say, oh, well, maybe that's because they're not playing such great opponents, and I think that's fair. Uh, but the reality is, you know, Michigan has been consistent for nine weeks now um, on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I, I just think, you know, Penn State's going to have to put points on the board. Um, this can't be another Ohio State. Um, you know, maybe the Maryland game last week was a sign of things to come. We don't know, but, you know, they can't score 12 points and expect to be Michigan. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be a game in the 20s, Seth. Um I think Michigan's going to win. I'll just put my pick out there. You can put give yours later, but I'm going to pick um, Michigan to win this game, something like, I don't know, 28, 24, something like that. Um, I, I think that's – but Penn State's got to flip that, and, and I agree with you. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more on, on J.J. McCarthy. Um, do you think he's vastly better than, than Drew Aller, though? Um, you you kind of look at the stats, and, and I think he's probably been the victim of not playing entire games. Um you know, the, the way Aller has, well, not, that's not true though, because Aller has been, you know, taken out in the fourth quarter for, of several games. Um, how big do you think that advantage is today, knowing what you saw from Drew Aller last week um, when you compare these two guys? I still do think that JJ McCarthy is better than Drew Aller. You know, Aller has shown the flashes and I think a lot of, you know, the struggles this year have been due to that, you know, lackluster receiving core, um, but I think JJ has the experience and that, and that he has the edge and he has the consistency, um, drew, you know, he really hasn't shown on a consistent basis that he's able to create drives down the whole field. Um, Penn States, you know, had opportunities really around midfield or just behind that's, that's kind of where they start most of their drives this year, uh, because of how good that defense has been. Um, and also, you know, they've been pretty impressive on special teams, um, but once Drew shows, you know, that he's able to do that on a consistent basis, that's when things start to flip. But, you know, J.J. McCarthy has shown he can do that. Um, and that being said, Michigan does have a better receiving core um, and they're more experienced. Um, so, you know, if Penn State's receivers step up, Drew could have a big game, you know, like he did last time is because his receivers were open. Dante Cephas was open. So we had two touchdowns. Um, Tyler Warren was open. Um, Keandre Lambert Smith was open. So if you do that again, you know, things, things could, uh, could get interesting, but you know, again, this is a very, very tough Michigan secondary. You mentioned Dante Cephas. You mentioned how, like, I thought everyone looked better this week against, against Maryland. 
was that because they were playing Maryland or, or do you think that there's something there? Do you think that this is a better team going into this game against Michigan than it was going into the game against Ohio state? Yeah. Well, we talked to Olu Fashionu this morning who said that this is the most confident, you know, the offense has felt going into a big game um, this whole year. And I think, why wouldn't they be, you know, they were, they were incredible on all facets last week. Um, you know, Drew told us after the game that things did click, things did click after that, after that Indiana game where he threw his first career interception and fouled it off and fouled it up with that, you know, 57 yard game winning touchdown pass to Keandre. Um, that's when things I think clicked for him. And that's, he told us that. Uh, and we saw that through four touchdowns against Maryland. Um, now the big question is whether that's able to transfer over against you know the nation. They are they are statistically the nation's most dominant defense, um, and whether he's able to you know do it again on a big stage and and you know put balls in in tight corners um, because there aren't going to be you know a lot of open receivers you know not nearly as many as there were last weekend. Yeah, I agree. Um... Seth, I want to just get a couple more quick hit topics before we wrap up for the week here. Um, number one, it's Big Noon Saturday coming to Happy Valley. Um, is there a more malignant force in college force in college sports right now than uh, playing this game at noon and, and not building up the day toward it, or, or um, are, are you fine with that? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty brutal. I mean, as as someone covering the game, like I do, like to go you know two to three hours before kickoff and um, and settle in, and that means that I have to get there at you know, 9 a.m., um, 8.30 in the morning, um, which just isn't – it isn't very fun. And um, I know it's not very fun for the tailgaters either who have to get up early and start drinking at 5 in the morning. Um, it's it, it takes the life out of, you know, some of these events. And, and I think that it's bad for Penn State, um, who really uses these big opponents um, typically um, as their big primetime – you know, kicks, it's huge for recruiting and, um, and that's kind of been taken away. You know, they are going to have a lot of recruits at this game, um, who will also have to wake up eight in the morning. Um, and if I'm a recruit and I'm going on a visit, you know, it's not, it's not going to be the best day ever. If, if I'm waking up at, you know, eight in the morning in November and, and having to stand outside for a few hours. So that's, that's personally me. Um, if I were a recruit, I'd like to see a nighttime kick and, and the fireworks and, um, and all that, and that just won't be the case this year. Um, and then they have another noon kick against against Rutgers the next week. So it's like it's almost every week. I think it's going to be a total of seven this year, which is a ridiculous amount of noon kickoffs. Uh, but this is the new age of college football with these TV deals. So how much you can do about it? Yeah, big thanks to Fox for uh, for for doing this to college football. Um, because here's the thing, you, you, Penn State, Michigan would draw a, an audience in the primetime window, even if there's other games on, and and that's that's what's disappointing is that that it's it's all about you know optimizing. It's not as if they're not going to get a big audience. It's that it's not optimal, and that's that's why Big Noon Saturday exists, and that's that's the frustrating part. And it does, I think, take away from the experience of you know these big like night games, and you, you mentioned the recruits. They they don't get to have a day at Penn State now. They get to have an afternoon. And then it builds toward nothing, especially if they lose. You know, it's, I think it's a huge disadvantage for Penn State and really, you know, any team, even Ohio State beating Penn State a couple of weeks ago. Did they get kind of the the, the boost out of that? That um, you know, because we were walking, it was still light outside. I'm walking around. They're cleaning up everything. It didn't feel. I didn't feel the excitement after that game that I might have felt if it was after a night game and people are fired up and going out to the bars and all that. It, it just didn't feel the, the way a big game should feel. Um, so thanks to Fox sports for that. Let's get into a little Penn state hoops last, uh, well, last night where we're recording this Penn state beat Delaware state 79, 45 Kanye Clary had 22 points. Um, some other standout performances, Seth, you were there. I didn't get to watch cause it was on big 10 plus and I'm not paying for that streaming service to watch like three Penn state basketball games. So tell us what you thought of, of Mike Rhodes and his debut last night. Yeah, I think first things first, you know, this is a much quicker team. I know it's Delaware State, but this is my, my takeaway. This is a much quicker team than I think anyone was expecting right out of the gates. Um, this is a group with 10 new players from last year's team. Only three scholarship guys remained. And they looked, you know, relatively in sync despite turning the ball over 21 times um, and had some really 
great performances from two of the guys who stayed. Um, so it was Kanye Clary, like you said, with the 22 points. And Jameel Brown, who scored 12 points all of last year, a combined 12 points, he scored a career-high 20 while knocking in six threes. Um, that was that was impressive to me. Um, it was cool how, you know, they had these transfers, um, these big-name transfers too. Ace Baldwin was the A-10 player of the year last year. Zach Hicks was from Temple. Puff Johnson they brought in. He didn't play last night. Um, a number of these big name guys um, who were still, you know, it was it was the returnees who made the impact, um, and they played they played pretty well last night. So I think there's some potential with this team. Uh, it's interesting as you look around the Big Ten, Michigan State, you know, falling to James Madison. Um, Rutgers lost to Princeton, and Penn State is. You know, all of a sudden they're one and zero, and and they did so in in pretty convincing fashion. I wanted to ask about Kanye Clary because I I saw that point total last night and it, it jumped off the page at me in a way that reminded me of um, when Tim Frazier kind of took over after the Taylor battle, Andrew Jones, um, David Jackson, that group that got Penn State to the NCAA tournament last time they made it. Um, after those guys left, Tim Frazier went from being a bit player, a quick guard who could score maybe two four points a game and um, you know, just kind of chip in to, um, you know, he, he it was an all-time program great, I think. He play, had a, has had a long NBA career, certainly relative to, you know, most other Penn State, Penn Staters of recent vintage. Um, did did you get those vibes off of, of Kanye Clary last night, kind of, um, you know, taking over a little bit in, in, in that role? Yeah, I mean, I – he led, he led in scoring, um, but it was more so what he did in terms of controlling the offense that stood out to me, where this was a guy who you could see had clear freedom of the offense, where he was able to kind of sprint around the court, um, draw defenders, and then find open guys. And, you know, he, he had multiple passes behind the back um, that looked really nice, and um, it was interesting. He, he kind of looked like a street baller, um, which is cool, and you don't really get to see that. Um, at this level of play, but I think Mike Rhodes has, you know, trust in him. Um, what was interesting to me is that Kanye Clary isn't supposed to be that Tim Frazier type of guy. You know, that was supposed to be Ace Baldwin, um, who followed Mike Rhodes from VCU and, you know, has all these accolades. Um, but last last night, I mean, it, Baldwin struggled five points on one of eight shooting. Um, he did lead with five assists, but I mean, Clary was running the show. Um, Clary had more minutes than him, um, and it, it was uh, it was really impressive. So if he keeps that up, you know, I, I think he could be a, a really underrated, you know, guy for for these Big Ten teams to kind of game plan for. What are your expectations for this team, Seth? Having seen them once um, and, and knowing what you know about the preseason predictions, I think kind of have them being maybe a fringe bubble team, um, but but not a, a team that's protect particularly. F- favored to, to make the NCAA tournament field. Um, is that your read on this team? Are you going to have to see more to, to, to change that expectation? Or, or did you see enough to say, hey, maybe this team could be in the mix for something? Yeah, it's really too soon. Because, I mean, yesterday was the first true game that these guys had played together ever. Um, they played three exhibition games in the offseason, and this was number four game these guys had ever played um, outside of practices and scrimmages. So, you know, it's going to take some time. Um, I think the turnovers were a product of, you know, those growing pains and, and we'll, we'll, it will take some time before they're actually able to, to, I guess, reach their potential um, of the Mike Rhodes era. Um, you know, he said they're nowhere close to where he kind of projects them to be, but if they shoot the ball as well as they, as they did last night, I don't think the tournament is out of the question. Yeah, I, I think that's where I am. I think it's unlikely, but not like it's not that I can't imagine them going on some kind of run and, and gelling by the end of the season and being a decent team. Um, Seth, I, I gave my Penn State Michigan prediction. Before we get out of here, what's yours? Oh man, it's it's like I don't know. I, I do think Michigan's going to win. I was like struggling with the score. It could be. I think it's going to be similar to like that Penn State Auburn game in twenty twenty one, like similar scoring to that. Um, better defense. I, I would go like twenty eight twenty twenty eight twenty one. It, it'll be. I, I I think Michigan will be able to win by a touchdown. Um, but I, I think Penn State showed some improvement in offense. Uh, I don't know. That that could change, but that's my tentative prediction is like 
I'll, I'll go 28-21. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I think you and I are in the same neighborhood. I think Penn State's going to hit some plays. I, I think they're going to do some impressive things that maybe we haven't seen them do this season. I just don't think it's going to be enough. So I'm going to go with Michigan in this one. I've, I've thought that since the preseason, so I'm not uh, changing my mind now. But, Seth, thanks for stopping by. Good chat. We will hopefully have a lot more to talk about next week. Um, also, stay tuned for after the game on Saturday. Seth will have his post-game video from Beaver Stadium. Um, he'll get the first crack at, at breaking everything down. So make sure you're, you're subscribed uh, to the channel for that. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Help us out in the YouTube algorithm. Um, really pleased with the, the growth and audience we've had from this Penn State podcast this year. But we can always do better. So uh, please help us out, and we will talk to you again next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>